going to continue this series, Life in the Confines of Fear. Have you guys learned anything the last few weeks about facing fears, dealing with fears, not letting fear control you? Anything? Yeah? We started this by kind of facing fears. We went door to door and invited people to come and join us for Easter, right? That was fun. I was also a little bit nervous going knocking on somebody's door. Um, the next week after that, we talked about the fear of failed expectations. And we know that we can, um, when we realize that God is in control and we trust that he's working even when we can't see him, then even when things don't turn out the way we expect, then we know that God can still do something. Then the week after that, we talked about the fear of being overwhelmed by stress. And we said stress is a test of where your heart what rests. So if our heart rests in Jesus, then we don't have to stress about what might come. Last week we said, uh, we talked about the fear of being mistreated. And how do we deal with the fear of being mistreated? We learn how to confront biblically, right? We talked about confrontation and, and bringing uh, about resolution and conflict. And we talked about the, you know, the good way to do that in the way that Matthew 18 tells us in the Bible. Tonight, we are going to talk about, uh, or as we continue this series, the fear of being ignored. How many of you guys hate being ignored? Yeah? It happens a lot. You know, um, you think about what, what you might do to avoid being ignored, right? You, you could go on one end of the spectrum and you're like, I'm not even going to show up because somebody might ignore me, so I'm just going to stay back and not do anything. And then the other end of the spectrum, you say, I'm going to show out so that somebody will recognize me, right? I'm not going to be ignored. Um, So that kind of can tend to making you do things that you might not normally do to get attention, right? It might cause you to do something that you regret because you wanted to get attention. And Here's the big lie I want you to write down. A lot of people believe this lie, they live this lie, and this controls their life. I'll do whatever it takes to get attention. I'll do whatever it takes to get attention. So in the idea of being ignored, I'll do whatever it takes to not be ignored. Right? That is a straight up lie that you need to not believe. It's the truth that people live that, they, they do that, but it's a lie that that is a positive thing for your life. Many people buy that lie. They do some really bad things to avoid being ignored. And you think about that. You think about, I've, I've probably been in a situation in time or two in my life, I'm sure, where I just didn't want to be ignored, so I did something, right? I did something I regretted, maybe. Shout out in class. That could, yeah, that could be one thing. Tonight, I want to look at a story in the Old Testament and see what happened when people thought they were being ignored, okay? So we're going to look in, in the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 18. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app, you're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 18. And um, this guy in, uh, well, we'll just read here. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 and 21. Ahab sent messengers to all the Israelites. Now, Ahab was the king of Israel, uh, and so he's, that's why he sent out messengers. He sent messengers to the Israelites and had the prophets assemble at Mount Carmel. Elijah approached all the people and said, how long are you going to be paralyzed by indecision? If the Lord is the true God, then follow him. But if Baal is, follow him. But the people did not say a word. That drives me bonkers. When I ask something and then they just, you're just like, I hate that response, right? Shira's getting stressed out right now thinking about it. That response, unlike any other response, has the ability to immediately get under my skin, and I'm like already agitated. If Elijah shows up, Ahab is the king of Israel. He calls everybody to show up to Mount Carmel. Now, Mount Carmel is important because um, Elijah says, here's the thing, guys, Israelites. You've been following God for some time, and then you flip-flop and you follow this false god Baal. Now Baal was known as the god of storms and thunder and rain. Okay? His wife was the goddess Asherah. Asherah. And so she was the goddess of fertility. So if you're trying to grow crops, how many of you guys know you want rain and you want to have fertile ground, right? So they would worship Baal and Asherah and and so they would... um, 
try to honor them so that everything would go well in their life. Well, right now Israel is experiencing a drought. And so how many of you guys know if you're the God of rain and it's not raining, what's that mean? You're not doing your job, job, right? So they get, everybody gets called to Carmel. Now, the Mount Carmel was what they believed to be Baal's home because the mountain was commonly surrounded by storms. So they thought it rains a lot there, so that must be where Baal lives. And so they show up in Baal's house, right? That's weird, right? But in their minds, this is where Baal lives, so this is where we're going to go. The king has been an evil king. He's not been encouraging the people to serve the Lord. In fact, how many of you heard somebody like a woman that was called Jezebel? You guys know that's not a good name if you call a woman a Jezebel, right? I mean, she's kind of loose in her ways. Well, Jezebel led a lot of people the wrong way. She, she killed prophets of God. She honored prophets of Baal. And that's Ahab's wife. So ba- Ahab was not a good dude either. And so they show up and Elijah, the prophet of God, shows up and he says, listen, you guys make a decision today. You stop flip-flopping, stop going back and forth. Either serve God or serve Baal, but don't try and ride the fence. And so when he asks this question, he gets this dead silence. And if it was me, if I'm in Elijah's shoes, I'm agitated already because you people heard me. I know you heard me. I know your ears work, right? You guys ever feel that way? Unless they're deaf. Unless they're deaf. But these people were not deaf. They were seemingly ignoring him. And so he, he made this, this offer to them. He said, hey, if Baal is God, serve him. If God is God, serve him. And... Um, so he says, I've got a little, a little challenge. We're going to each offer a sacrifice. We're going we're to make an altar. We're going to get a bull. We're going to kill it. We're going to put it on the altar. And the God that responds with fire will be the true God, right? So it's going to be a showdown between God of Israel, Yahweh, and Baal, and they're in Baal's house on Mount Carmel. So look what verse 24 says. Elijah said, uh, then you invoke the name of the Lord your God, and I will invoke the name of the Lord. The God who responds with fire will demonstrate that he is the true God. And here's where all the people responded. This will be a fair test. So the first time he says, hey, are you guys going to serve God or are you going to serve Baal? And they ignore him. They are quiet. They just deadpan, stare him like, I don't know what you're saying. And then they get some bulls and Elijah says, hey, we're going to sacrifice a bull on this altar. I'm going to sacrifice a bull on this altar. You guys can call out to your God and, and I'm going to call out to my God. And the God that answers with fire is God. And everyone says, yes, cool idea, Elijah. Yes, Hope. Uh, so by bull, you mean a living animal. Uh, yes, they took a living animal and they killed it and they put it on some stones. Very common practice in the Old Testament. So, write this down. Number one, the silence was broken, and the people said this is the fair test. The fair test. How many of you guys think that would be a test that would be cool to see? Like, fire is going to come out of the sky and burn stuff up. I think that would be pretty cool. So look at verse 25 of 1 Kings 18. Elijah told the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls for yourselves and go first for you are the majority. There's like 450 prophets of Baal and there's one Elijah. I'd say they had a majority. Well, in their mind, they had a majority. Invoke the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took a bowl, as he had suggested, and prepared it. They invoked the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Baal, answer us. But there was no sound and no answer. They jumped around on the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them. Yell louder! After all, he is a god. He may be in a deep thought, or perhaps he stepped out for a moment, or has taken a trip. Perhaps he is sleeping and needs to be awakened. So they yelled louder, and in accordance with their prescribed ritual, mutilated themselves with swords and spears until their bodies were covered with blood. Throughout the afternoon, there was an ecstatic frenzy, but there was no sound, no answer, no response. So it's no longer Elijah. Elijah had posed this question, hey, if God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. The people are like quiet. And he says, okay, well, let's see who the real God is. Let's offer a bull. And the God that answers the fire is the real God. And the people are like, okay, now we'll talk to you, Elijah. And then they have their chance for Baal to show up and show out. And so they got their their bull on the altar. And from the morning until noon, they're like, oh, Baal, 
please bail, please answer us, bail, 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 do you hear us, bail, bail, are you there, bail? And Elijah watches them for a few hours, and then he starts making fun of them. He starts suggesting that their God is asleep. In fact, if you have a New International Version or a New Living Translation, it says that perhaps he's relieving himself. In other words, maybe he's on the toilet and he can't come right now. He can't answer the call. And so the prophets of Baal, they, they then, after Elijah starts making fun of them, they go to a completely different... Now remember, the, the answer to the test is going to be that fire is going to show up and burn up the altar. Look what they did. They started jumping on the altar. Does that make any sense? If you think fire is going to come to this place right here, Would you want to jump up here on this place if you thought fire was going to come on this place? No, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to do that. But that's what they do. They think they're being ignored, so they start getting crazier and crazier and crazier. Now, remember, Baal was supposed to be the god of storms and rain and thunder, and there had been no storms or rain or thunder. And so they thought, in their minds, the land had this drought, and they, they, it wasn't, they, well, Elijah had actually prophesied. He said, listen, at the word of the Lord, at the word of God, there's not going to be any rain until I say it should rain. And then he goes away, and guess what? There was no rain. But the worshipers of Baal thought, you know what? Our God has been trapped in the underworld by death. So in Greek mythology, they named that guy Hades, right? Well, I don't know what, the, what they named him, what the god of the underworld was in Canaanite mythology, but in their minds, Baal had been captured by death and was trapped in the underworld, and that's why he didn't answer them when they started calling. And so they thought, if we get crazier, Baal will hear us. He won't be able to ignore us any longer, and then he'll come. And then they said, you know what? We've got to do something to appease death. And so that's where they get this ritual and they took their, their spears and their swords and they started cutting themselves, thinking that if they shed their own blood, death would be appeased and release Baal and Baal would be able to show up and respond with fire. Because they thought they were being ignored. They thought, I've got to take matters into my own hands and no matter what it costs me, I'm not going to be ignored. Think about that. How many times have we been able to relate to this idea that no matter what it costs, no matter what I have to do, I'm not going to be ignored. And we look at the prophets of Baal and it got them nothing but sore voices and sore bodies and a lot of unnecessary wounds because they took that stance. And they got no answer for it. All of that energy, all of that time, all of that pain and all of that blood all pointed in the wrong direction because it got them nothing. I don't want you to experience that same thing. So what can we learn? The second thing I want you to write down is the Lord's answer. They had been putting all that energy in the wrong direction and Elijah calls him in verse 30 to 38. He says, then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he prepared, repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones and most people think, oh, actually it says right there, the, the, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be your name. So he takes these stones that signify the 12 tribes of Israel and he builds the Lord's altar again. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench around the altar as great as would contain two sayas of seed. And he put the wood in order and he cut the bull in pieces and he laid it on the wood. So he's got a stone altar. He's got the wood laid across the top of the stone. He's got the chunks of meat from the bull arranged on top of the wood. And then he, he did a weird thing. He dug a trench around, this, this, around the outside of the altar. And he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. That doesn't make any sense. Do water and fire go together? Nope, they don't. Fire and water are opposites. They cancel each other out. So, and he said, do it a second time. So if he started with, with four jars of water and he does it a second time how many jars of water have gone on now 
eight. Right? He had four. And he said, let's do it again. So four times two is eight, right? And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. So how many jars have gone on at this point? Twelve. I don't have enough fingers. Five, ten and two, right? Twelve jars of water had gone on. And the water ran down the altar and filled the trench also with water. So now what's supposed to be catching with fire is drenched and the area around is soaked with water. And at that time, at the time of the offering of ablation, which would have been about three o'clock in the afternoon. So the prophets of Baal did their thing for probably about six hours, give or take. They cried out, they danced on the altar, they cut themselves and nothing. About three in the clock, which is the time that the offering would have been offered in the temple in Jerusalem, that's when Elijah gets his chance. Elijah the prophet came near and said, listen, listen to what he said. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are the God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. In other words, let everybody know That you are the God that Abraham served, that Isaac served, and that Jacob or Israel served. And you're the God of the nation of Israel. Let everybody know that I have just been doing what you told me to do. I'm your servant. Then in verse 37, he says, answer me, O Lord, answer me. That this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and you have turned their hearts back. In other words, it's not just a general let it be known. He wants the people that are there watching, the, the Israelites that have been called to Mount Carmel, to Baal's house, he wants them to see that God is real and he wants their hearts to be turned back from serving other gods and serving false gods and serving Baal to serving God. And verse 38 gives the answer. Then the fire of the Lord fell and it consumed the burnt offering and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. In other words, the bowl wasn't just cooked. The entire area was consumed in the fire of God. Elijah didn't make a lengthy prayer. He didn't jump around like a crazy guy. He didn't cut himself and bleed all over the place, expecting that God would respond to his shed blood. He simply was obedient to God. He rebuilt the Lord's altar. He put the stones in place. He brought the sacrifice at the right time. And he said, God, I'm your servant. Please show up. And did God show up? Yeah, he did. God showed up. He revealed himself in a way that these very stubborn and hard-hearted people could have no other response but to say, that God is the true God. And look at this, number three, the people's response. First Kings 18.39 simply says, and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So was Elijah's prayer answered? Yeah, it was. In fact, every way that Elijah prayed The answer came. He said, Lord, God of Isaac, Israel, or uh, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Israel, I need you to show up and show these people who you are and turn their hearts back to you. And God showed up and he showed who he was and he turned the people's heart back to him because they said they'd been wavering. They'd been going on the fence. You guys ever tried to walk on a fence? It's pretty dangerous maneuver to try and walk on a fence because when you fall, you're in for a lot of pain. It's a lot of hurt when you walk the fence. And these people have been walking the fence for so long. And if you read, if you have your Bible and you read the next verse, it says, and all the people slaughtered the prophets of Baal because they were false prophets. And in the Old Testament, God said, if anybody is a false prophet, they should die. And these people so turned back to God that they were so obedient to his word that they said, the Lord is God. And then they turned around and they got rid of the people that were trying to lead them to false gods. And as we prepare to close, and I want you guys to focus in for just a couple more minutes. This is where I want you to get your attention. Number four, your responsibility. We saw the fair test, the Lord's answer, the people's response, 
And it comes down to what do we do? What is your responsibility? How should you respond when you feel ignored? Instead of believing the lie that I should do whatever it takes to get somebody's attention, how will you respond even if you feel like God doesn't hear you? These people, the prophets of Baal felt ignored and they went from just asking and pleading to acting crazy and cutting themselves and it got them nothing. It got them nowhere. In fact, it got them killed because they had been false prophets. So you shouldn't just do whatever you think will get you attention You have to feed yourself with some truth that says, I know how I'm feeling right now, but I know what reality is. God isn't like a puppet that we can just pull his strings and expect him to respond, right? Look at this verse, 2 Kings chapter 19, verse, the second part of verse 31 says, the intense devotion of the sovereign Lord to his people will accomplish this. In other words, if God tells you something, if God has a promise, he will see it through with intense devotion for you. You guys know what intense devotion is? It means he's committed to you. His promise to you is a commitment to you and he will see it through and he will complete it. Hebrews chapter 13 verse six says, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. In other words, we know that we can trust God and rely on him because because nobody can change the fact that God is our helper. In fact, look at John, what Jesus says in John 14, verses 15 to 17. He says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Then I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. So Jesus is talking about the fact that we have the Holy Spirit And he says, whom the world cannot accept because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he resides with you and will be in you. Think about that. We know that the Lord is my helper. I don't have to fear anything. Nobody can, man, what can man really do to me? And then we have this promise that Jesus says, the Holy Spirit is with you and the Holy Spirit is in you. Psalm 46, 11, look at this. The Lord who commands armies is on our side. The God of Jacob is our protectors. That God has this picture of the Lord who commands armies is a picture that God has thousands upon thousands upon thousands of angels in his army and they are at his very beck and call that if he has to call them somewhere, they will go. So when we call to him, he will answer us. He doesn't ignore us. So what is our responsibility? To look to God. When we feel ignored, wait on God. When we feel like I have to do something to get attention, be patient and know that God is your protector, that God is your savior, that God is with you and the Holy Spirit resides in you. And so when we feel ignored, we turn to God and allow the truth of his word to fill us and overwhelm us. Let's pray tonight. Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity that we've had to look into your word. And I pray that you would help us, Lord, to have the right response to you tonight. There may be some in this room that have been doing whatever it takes to get attention. Lord, tonight I pray that they would see that when we don't turn to you, We're leading ourselves into fruitless endeavors. We put a lot of activity into things that produce no response. But Lord, when our faith and our hope and our trust is in you, when we come simply in prayer, we know that you answer in powerful ways. So Lord, I pray that we would stop putting energy in things that produce no life. And instead, we would put our hope and our trust and our faith in you. 
Jesus, speak to our hearts tonight.